finding the derivatives of powers. First off, do you remember the formula for finding the derivative of a function f? The derivative is just the slope of a tangent line. So to find the slope of a tangent line, what we did is we took two points, say we want the tangent line here, we took another point that's very close by, with an x-coordinate just a little bit bigger, say x plus h, and the y-coordinates of these two points are f of x and f of x plus h. So the slope of the line connecting them is f of x plus h minus f of x, that's the change in the y-coordinates, divided by the change in the x-coordinates. x plus h minus x is just h. And what we're interested in is what happens when the second point gets very, very close to the first point. So then we're left with just the tangent line at the first point. So if they get close together, that means that x plus h is getting closer and closer to x, or another way of saying that is h is getting close to zero. So we'll take the limit as h goes to zero of this quantity here. Right. For a function f, the derivative of f equals f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h and the limit as h goes to zero. Now let's use this definition to find the derivative of the function f of x equals x squared. What's the formula for the derivative of this specific function? If f of x is equal to x squared, that means this thing here, f of x, is just x squared. This object here, f of x plus h, can be found using the same rule. Instead of squaring x, now we're squaring x plus h. So that's x plus h squared. That means the derivative of f, f prime of x, is going to be the limit as h approaches 0 of x plus h squared minus x squared, all divided by h. Right. The function f squares things, so f of x plus h equals x plus h squared. Now we're subtracting x squared from that. Now which of the following is equal to the square of x plus h? x plus h squared is just x plus h times x plus h. And now we can treat this as one object and just distribute. So it's that times that, that times that. So we're left with x plus h times x plus x plus h times h. Now we can distribute again to get x squared plus hx from the first set plus xh plus h squared. Now these two terms are the same, so we can add them together. So we're left with x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Right. x plus h squared equals x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So let's plug that back into our limit. In the numerator, we have x squared minus another x squared, so those cancel out. Also, the h in the denominator cancels out this h here and one of the h's in the h squared here. That leaves us with 2x plus h. So what's the limit of 2x plus h as h approaches 0? As h becomes very, very small, we don't end up dividing by 0 or multiplying by infinity. So if we want to take the limit as h goes to 0, we could actually just take 0 and plug it in for h. That just gives us 2x. Exactly. As h goes to 0, this expression approaches 2x. So we've just proven that the derivative of x squared is 2x. OK, now let's find the derivative of x cubed. Here's the definition of the derivative again. And this time, we'll say f of x equals x cubed. That means we're cubing the terms in the numerator of this limit. 
which of the following expressions is equal to the cube of x plus h? To figure out x plus h cubed, we take x plus h and multiply it by itself three times. Now, we know how to multiply x plus h times x plus h. We did that last time, and we got x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Now we have to take that and multiply it by x plus h. To do this, we can use the distributive property again. x times x squared gives us x cubed. 2xh times x gives us plus 2x squared h h squared times x gives us plus x h squared. Now we take the h. h times x squared is going to give us plus x squared h. h times 2xh gives us plus 2xh squared. And finally, h times h squared gives us plus h cubed. If we try to simplify this, we see that the x squared h here can be combined with the x squared h here, so we're left with x cubed plus 3x squared h. The xh squared can be combined with this 2xh squared, so we get plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. this expression is equal to x plus h cubed. Let's plug it back into the limit. The x cubed and minus x cubed terms cancel. Then the h in the denominator cancels out this h, turns this h squared into h, and turns this h cubed into h squared. Next we'll evaluate this limit. As h goes to zero, what does this expression approach? Again, as h gets very small, we're not dividing by zero or multiplying by infinity, so we can actually just take zero and plug it in for h every time we see it. If we do that, we're left with 3x squared. Zero times x times three is just zero, so that term goes away, and zero times zero is also zero, so that term goes away. We're left with just 3x squared. Right. The terms with the h's in them go to zero, leaving us with 3x squared. So the derivative of x cubed equals 3x squared. So far we've shown that the derivative of x squared equals 2x, and the derivative of x cubed equals 3x squared. Do you have a guess for what the derivative of x to the nth power might be? Well, we're just trying to take a guess, so let's look for some patterns. Let's focus on the powers of x's to begin with. When we take the derivative of x squared, we're left with x. x by itself is just x to the first power, so the power of x went down by 1. When we took the derivative of x cubed, we were left with an x squared. Again, the power of x went down by 1. So if we're taking the derivative of x to the n, a good guess is that the power of x is going to go down by 1, so we'll have x to the n minus 1. The only answer that has x to the n minus 1 in it is the first one. The others don't match this pattern, so they're not correct. Correct. To find the derivative of x to the nth power, put an n in front of the x and subtract 1 from the exponent. This rule works for these two powers up here, and it turns out it works for every power. You can prove this is the derivative whenever n is a whole number, using what's called the binomial theorem. But we won't be covering that in this tutorial. Alright, let's put this formula to work. What's the derivative of x to the 10th power? Remember that this d over dx here is another way to write that we're taking the derivative of the function inside the parentheses here, x to the 10th. Now we can use this formula and f of x is equal to x to the tenth. And if f of x is x to the n, that means n is equal to 10. So what's the derivative? Well, we can plug a 10 
into that formula to get 10x to the 10 minus 1, or 9. So the derivative of x to the 10th is 10x to the 9th. Right. The derivative of x to the 10th is 10x to the 9th. This rule works whenever the powers are whole numbers. Later on, you'll see why this same rule works for any value of n, even when n isn't a whole number. In this tutorial, you'll find the derivative of the sine function. So up here is a graph of the function sine of x. And down here, you can graph the derivative by dragging your finger across the screen. So as you drag your finger across, you'll see the tangent line plotted in the top graph. If the tangent line is colored green, you'll know you're on the right track. So after you're done, you can check your answer by pressing this button down here to see if you have the right derivative. What does the derivative of the sine of x look like? Let's try drawing the derivative from left to right. A tangent line over here has a positive slope, a tangent line here would have a slope of zero, and a tangent line over here would have a negative slope. So if we're trying to graph the derivative, we'd start at a positive value, and then go down to zero, and then go down to a negative value. Why don't you continue drawing tangent lines, or use the tangent lines that are drawn for you, to figure out the rest of the derivative, then match it to one of the functions on the left. In case you forget what these functions look like, the sine function looks like this. It has a positive slope at the origin. The cosine function starts at a maximum and then goes down on both sides. The tangent function starts at zero and then goes up to an asymptote and down to an asymptote at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. Which one looks like the derivative that you drew? Okay, so you think the derivative of the sine of x looks like cosine of x. Now let's find out if that's right, or if the derivative of the sine function is something else. First off, what's the formula you can use to find the derivative of sine of x? A formula for the derivative of some function f at a point x is f of x plus h minus f of x, so it's the difference between two nearby y-coordinates divided by the difference of their x-coordinates, which is just h. Then we take the limit as h gets very close to zero. In this case, f of x is sine of x, so we want to plug that in for f of x to get the limit as h goes to zero, and instead of f of x plus h, we can have sine of x plus h minus sine of x all divided by h. Great. Let's see how you got that. The definition of the derivative for a function f is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h in the limit as h goes to zero. Here, the function f of x is the sine of x. So in the numerator here, f of x plus h is sine x plus h, and f of x is sine x. Now, can you use a trig identity to find an equivalent expression for the sine of x plus h?
A useful trig identity here is that the sine, the sum of two angles, so the sine of a plus b, is equal to the sine of a times the cosine of b plus the cosine of a times the sine of b. Why don't you try using that for the expression down here to see if you can get the answer. Right, you can use the addition identity for sines. The sine of x plus h equals sine x cosine h plus sine h cosine x. Let's plug this expression back into the limit. Now we'll just move some terms around in the numerator, but we're not really changing anything here. And since all these terms in the numerator are being divided by h, we can break this expression up into the sum of two different fractions. And now we have the limit of the sum of two different terms here. So we can break this up into the sum of two different limits. Let's look at this first limit here, the limit as h goes to zero of sine h cosine x over h. What's an equivalent way to write this limit? Notice that this term here doesn't have any h's in it. So as far as the limit is concerned, it's just some number or a constant. That means we could bring it out in front of the limit sign without changing the value of the limit. So if we simplify the limit, we now have the cosine of x, it's just some constant, times the limit as h goes to zero of sine of h divided by h. Nicely done. We're taking the limit of this expression as h goes to zero. X has nothing to do with this limit, so we can pull the cosine x term outside the limit. So now we have this expression here, the limit as h goes to zero of sine h over h. What does this limit equal? This trig limit is actually quite important, so it's worth memorizing, but if you ever forget it, you can always try plugging in a very small value of h into this expression here. Try plugging in h equals 0 0.001 down here and see what number it's close to. Let's try plugging in h equals 0 0.001 into this expression down here. If we take out the calculator and evaluate sine 0.001 divided by 0.001, we get a number that's very, very close to 1. So this limit is approximately equal to 1, and if you try plugging in an even smaller number, you'll find that you get even closer to 1. So that's the answer. Right, this limit equals 1. So this term is cosine x times 1, which is cosine x. Now let's take a look at this second term here. What's an equivalent way to write this limit? Both terms in the numerator have a sine x in them, so we can factor it out. If we factor it out, the numerator looks like sine of x times cosine of h minus 1. The denominator is still going to be h, and the limit is still out here. Now sine of x doesn't have any h in it, so as far as the limit is concerned it's just a constant, and we can pull it out front. That leaves us with the sine of x times the limit as h goes to 0, of cosine of h minus 1 divided by h. Exactly. You can factor the sine x out of the numerator here so that it's sine x times cosine h minus 1. And because this is a limit as h goes to 0, sine x has nothing to do with this limit, so we can pull it out, just like we did for the cosine x in the earlier limit. 
Okay, last question. Try evaluating this limit that we're left with. The limit as h goes to zero of cosine h minus one over h. If you don't remember this limit down here, you can try plugging in a very small number for h. Let's try 0 0.001. If we plug that in, we get the cosine of 0 0.001 minus 1. And that whole thing is divided by 0 0.001. We end up with a very small number. So a good guess for this limit is that it approaches 0. If that doesn't convince you, you can try plugging in an even smaller number for h, or you can check out the next two hints, which give a better derivation. One way to approach this limit is to multiply the numerator and denominator by the cosine of h plus 1. Now if you expand the numerator and use a trig identity, you should be able to get this to be the product of two limits that you can calculate. Why don't you give that a shot and see if it works? Let's follow the last hint and rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of the cosine of h minus 1 times the cosine of h plus 1, all divided by h times the cosine of h plus 1. So we multiply the top and bottom by the cosine of h plus 1. Now if we expand the numerator, we get the limit as h goes to 0 of the cosine squared of h minus 1, all divided by h times the cosine of h plus 1. Now cosine squared minus 1 is negative 1 minus cosine squared, if we factor out a minus 1. And 1 minus cosine squared is just sine squared. So our limit is equal to, the limit is h goes to 0, of minus sine squared h over h times 1 plus cosine of h. Now we can rewrite minus sine squared of h as minus sine of h times sine of h. And now we have the limit of a product. We have the limit of this number times this number. And as long as neither limit is 0 or infinity, we can just take the product of the two limits. The limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h is 1. We know that from before. So this limit here is going to be minus 1. What about the other limit? Well, we can just plug in 0 for h. When we plug in 0 for h, we get sine of 0, which is 0, over 1 plus cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so we have 1 plus 1, which is 2 on the denominator. So this whole thing becomes negative 1 times 0 over 2, which is just 0. Right, this limit equals 0. So when we multiply sine x by 0, we still get 0. So the sine x term here goes away. And that leaves us with cosine x. And that's it. The derivative of sine x is indeed cosine x, just like you guessed at the beginning. Well done.